This week, we're going underwater, but thankfully, we're not going to be needing these. This week, I'm going to take you through a nifty lighting trick that allows you to shoot images that look like they were shot underwater in the comfort of your own home. Underwater shoots are amazing, but they're very costly and you need the right models, the right equipment and the right venue to be able to shoot stuff like that. They're also quite dangerous. So this will allow you to do stuff incredibly safely in the comfort of your home with very little cost. This technique could be applied to all sorts of genres of photography, not just model photography. You could use it for product photography, you could use it for toy photography. The possibilities are endless. You could also apply a lot of the same techniques to create very different images entirely. What I'm going to show you today will broaden your understanding of lighting and give you some really useful techniques to use elsewhere. If you watched the last video, you'll know I like to plan my images before I do them. As such, I'm going to take you through a little bit of my process and how I do that. As far as the planning process goes, I approach this very similarly to how I approach every shoot, in that it basically starts on Pinterest. Pinterest is an amazing platform for finding creative content, and it really helps to communicate with the rest of your team, your models or your makeup artists, what you're trying to achieve if you can find images that are visually similar to what you're looking for. So this is my Pinterest. Um, I've got a lot of boards, they're all very messy. Uh, it's not really for public viewing really, it's just for myself. So here's my underwater one. And you can see I've got a mix of images, but what I'm kind of getting at here is that it's this rippling pattern that I like. I don't know if you've seen Blade Runner, but the cinematography in that is amazing. And they have vast amounts of rippling on the walls. Uh, and it's done with a similar trick to what we're gonna try and do in the house. What I'm also trying to get a feel for using Pinterest is the styling for the image um, and even the direction for color work that I'm going to take on later on in the process. But with underwater stuff, it's likely to be fairly blue, so I can ignore that for now and, uh, and I can sort of work on that later. The last part of the process is planning the lighting. I do this with rough drawings like this um, and it's not always necessary, but I find that I'm able to visualize what I'm after easier. And then when I'm actually on the shoot, I'm able to achieve what I want much quicker because I already know where I want everything. Please excuse my terrible drawing skills for this, but if you couldn't recognize it, that's jade underneath the water. And I'm gonna have a light at the back pointing down. And then I'll have another light on this side. And this side, I'm gonna have a blue gel. What that blue gelled light is gonna do is add a blue tint to the image, particularly in the shadows. And that's really gonna help sell the idea that we're underwater. And then on this side, I think I'm gonna need a nice big reflector. So I'll put that there. That's my high tech drawing. It's awful, but I promise you I know what's going on there. Firstly, a few safety notes. We are gonna be working with water around pieces of electricity. Pieces of electricity. Firstly, a couple of bits on safety. Obviously, we're not going underwater, so there's very limited chance someone's gonna drown, but we are working with water and we are working with uh, electrical items. So some common sense safety precautions must be taken into account. Keep all electrics well away from the water and make sure you have ample space around your setup to ensure any spillages don't come into contact with electrics. We may be using some power tools for the build process, so if you are, some basic protective equipment would be advised. That's the safety bit done. Please don't hurt yourself. All right, let's move on to the build process. All I've used is some Perspex, some scrap wood, and some screws. Oh, and a little bit of sealant. This footage is actually of the first one we made. Um, I actually made a bigger one the second time around, and I didn't film that, unfortunately, um, but the process is exactly the same. All we do is cut some wood to create a rectangle on top of the perspex. So here I'm just squaring up the ends because this wood was used for another project. Then I'll just lay the perspex out and arrange the wood on there in a rectangle.
Now I'll just drill some pilot holes to ensure that my screws don't crack the wood as I attach them together. You can use some wood glue at this point as well, but it's not really necessary. Now I'm just going to draw around the inside edge of the wood on the perspex. And then put the perspex on top of the wood and line up that line with the inside line of the wood. That will give us a guide as to where to drill our holes. Use round head screws instead of countersink screws and careful not to drill too hard to ensure that you don't crack the perspex, like I did many times. Space these evenly around the perimeter using three or four on each edge to ensure that there's no bowing of the perspex. Then we'll turn it over and we'll run a knife along the inside edge of the wood so that we can peel away the protective film which is always the most satisfying thing to do. Now for the bit that I'm really bad at, using bathroom filler to seal up the edges. I apologize for my really ugly handiwork here. It's worth noting that you need to do this 24 hours ahead of time to allow the polyfiller to cure. We didn't leave this much time, so we also added some duct tape to ensure that it didn't leak. New glasses, sorry about the continuity error. So the footage you just saw of me building the um, what am I going to call it? A tray? The footage you just saw was actually me building the first of the uh, water tray, troughs, buckets, whatever you want to call it. And since then I've made a much larger one. So the larger one is the one we're going to be using for this. But it occurred to me that every time I've been able to use it in the past, I've been able to carry it out of the house or out of the building and then pour the water away outside. However, my doors aren't big enough for that here. So we've got a bit of a problem. So my novel solution for this is to drill a hole in it and then use some nuts, bolts, washers and some rubber um, to create a little plug hole. I don't have any rubber washers lying around so I've got some rubber sheeting, um, some nuts, bolts and washers and that's it. Oh, and a sharp knife to cut some stuff out. My thinking is I'll just drill a hole and then let the water drain out into a bucket. So I'm just going to create my own rubber washers with the rubber sheeting that I've got. Hopefully this works. We'll see. Two rubbish washers made by me. I reckon this might work. For this shoot, I will be shooting on an EOS R, this beast. I love this camera. I often shoot on a 5D Mark IV as well as an EOS R, 
but 90% of the time when I've given the choice between the two, I'll pick up the EOS R. The focusing is that much more accurate on this system, particularly when you're talking about shooting portraiture with very shallow depth of field. The eye detection autofocus just works unbelievably well. And that's all powered by the Dual Pixel AF system. Dual Pixel AF is the technology that Canon have that makes it different from everyone else. It allows for the focusing to work so smoothly and so accurately that I no longer use my digital SLRs because the on-sensor focusing system on this is so much better. Digital SLR focusing systems are only really designed to 2.8, so anything wider open than that, you're working within a bit of a tolerance. Whereas because mirrorless are focusing direct to sensor, when it says it's in focus, it is in focus, even at 1.2. Canon have kindly sent me a 50 1.2 for this, but generally I would be shooting on a 50 myself anyway. I shoot most of my portraiture on 50 millimeters, but ideally you want something between 50 and 100 millimeters for this sort of work. The reason for this is anything wider than that, you're gonna get too much of the room in and you'll start seeing light stands and, and other things that you don't want in the image. I actually shoot with an EF 50 mil adapted over to the EOS R most of the time, and it works better on the EOS R than it does on my 5D Mark IV. We're gonna be using speed lights for this project, if you watched my last video, you'll know how much I love speed lights. Speed lights are absolutely amazing. They are small, powerful, versatile, um, and you can create so much with them. I actually use the 600 EX Mark IIs. Um, I have a couple of them, and the transmitter, which is this STE3RT, very catchy name. Um, this is the transmitter that sits on top of the camera and communicates with the flash guns. They communicate via radio, so you don't have to have them line of sight. There's two-way communication as well, so I can actually tell the camera to take a picture from the flash gun if I have the camera on a tripod and I don't have a light stand for some reason. You can get a whole range of modifiers for flash guns. They're even weather sealed. I can't say a bad word against them. So if you've not used speed lights before, I'll show you how they work. When you turn the speed light on, you'll be met with ETTL mode. Just that there. To link them, all you do is you hit that little link button and you'll see lots of options. These are radio and I want it as radio slave. So that way it's ready to receive commands from this. You see the little lights have gone green now. Uh, that means it's ready and it's linked and paired. I can hit the fire button on this and it creates a flash. By default, the flash trigger is on ETTL mode, which is basically fully automatic it fires a pre-flash, which the camera registers, can see what the flash is doing, and then de determines the flash power and the metering of the camera all automatically for you. What that doesn't take into account is creative control. So I want to be able to manipulate multiple flashes at different powers and have full creative control. So what I recommend doing is hitting the mode button just there, and that's fully manual, but that's manual for all groups and you can control different groups in ratios. What I want is to be able to control them individually, so I'll move across to group, so GR. That way I can go in and I can set each group to whatever I want. I can turn it off, I can put it on ETCL, I can put it in manual, and then all I'm working with is dimmer switches on each group. So I can go higher and lower, and it's as simple as that. And when working with flashes in fully manual, you're essentially only working with dimmer switches, which makes it far simpler to understand and work with. The other reason I shoot flashes in fully manual is I'm looking for consistency. The lighting isn't gonna change very much in the scenario that we're shooting in. So if I have every image come back slightly brighter and slightly darker because the TTL system thinks that it should be slightly brighter or slightly darker, it's gonna make my editing process that much slower. That's not to say that ETTL doesn't have its uses. For events and weddings or situations where the lighting's gonna change and you need to react quickly, ETTL is great, but for a situation like this where we're working in a pretty controlled environment, there's just no need to have it on automatic. Something else I want to show you that I'm going to be using during this shoot is the ability to shoot tethered to a computer. What that means is I'm able to take a picture and it appears on my computer screen almost immediately. This used to be done entirely cabled and that's fine, it's very fast on a cable, but uh, obviously you are limited in flexibility in terms of movement because you've got this cable coming out of your camera all the time. I'm shooting on a Canon EOS R, so this may vary depending on the camera that you have, but if you have a Canon, it, I'm sure it'll be very similar. All we need to do to do this is hit the menu button, and we're going to cycle across to the yellow menu, 
and go to the fifth one across. That has wireless communication settings. Now this might be slightly different on your camera as I mentioned, but wireless communication settings is what you're after. Then I'm going to hit Wi-Fi settings, enable that. You can have your camera require a password so that your connection is secured. And then we hit Wi-Fi function. Because this hasn't been set up before, I need to set a name, so I'm just going to leave it as EOS R. I can have this connect to a smart frame and control it from there, but that is more for control of the camera rather than shooting tethered so that it just appears on the screen. So what I want to do is go across a remote control EOS utility, register a device for connection. What it's going to do is set up its own Wi-Fi hotspot. So you don't need to be connected to the internet in order to do this. You can set this up anywhere you like. So you can set this up in a desert if you needed to. But I'm going to set this up to connect to my home Wi-Fi. That way I don't have to disconnect my computer from the internet. So I can hit switch network. Then all I have to do is find my network and type in the password. You can also use connect with WPS if your router has this. That's my Wi-Fi network, but I'm going to connect with WPS. Now that I've connected to the Wi-Fi with the camera, all I need to do is start the software on my computer and it'll automatically find my camera. In order to do this, we need to open EOS Utility. If you don't have EOS Utility, you can download it from Canon's website. Open EOS Utility and click Pairing over Wi-Fi and LAN. Um, you might need to make some changes to your firewall settings to allow it to happen. And you can see there it's found my camera on the network. Connect it. And now it's just asking you for you to confirm it. Now if we go back to the desktop, EOS Utility is automatically starting for me. Now that we're connected, all we have to do is hit remote shooting. And this window will pop up. If we wanted to, hit live view shoot and we can actually take control of the camera remotely and see what it's seeing from the computer. So that screen will come up. There's a little bit of lag because my network's struggling a little bit. For the purposes of what we're doing today, I don't want to be controlling the camera from the computer. What I want to do is be able to see the images that I'm capturing appear on the computer screen so I can see them in more detail. However, as we're transmitting over Wi-Fi, I don't really want to be sending over the raw images. I just want to send a JPEG so that I can see a preview of it. So I'm going to go ahead and hit this button here. And that allows me to determine whether images are saved on the computer or on the camera or both. What I want to do is set it to the middle one, which is computer and camera memory card. I also want to hit, in RAW and JPEG mode, only transfer the JPEGs to the computer. And then hit OK. Now what I want to do is change the settings of the camera to allow it to shoot both RAW and JPEG. I can do that from this software as well. So I'll hit this button here and then ask it to say RAW and a small JPEG. I don't really need to see a full resolution image. I just need to see it bigger than the screen on the camera. That way I get a better idea for the details. So small JPEG works fine for me. Now, when I take a picture, it appears on the screen. There's multiple reasons I might want to shoot tethered. If you're working as part of a team, it means that multiple people can see the images more comfortably and they can see the details. But even if you're just working on your own, you're able to get a better idea of what the image is really going to look like. You can also have it run straight through software to apply a look. So if you're using Lightroom, you can actually have Lightroom apply a look to the image so that you get a better idea of what it's going to look like when it's finished. But crucially, you can see the details far better using this method than you can on the back of the camera. Another reason you might want to do this is for the models, so that they can see the images and adjust their pose accordingly. Because the models are always seeing things that you're not necessarily looking for. Alright, let's set up for the shoot and I'll show you how it's all going to work.
All I'm going to do to suspend this over Jade is to use some power cord, feed it through the hoops, feed it over the background stand, and then feed it back through the hoops and tie it off. Then I should be able to loosen or tighten it depending on the height that I need. Um, and then the front ends I'm just going to prop up on some furniture. In terms of camera settings and flash settings, we're going to set everything up into fully manual. The reason for this is I want full creative control and I don't want the automatic settings to uh, tell me what is correct because where I might want one light brighter than the other, the automatic settings isn't going to know that, it just wants everything to be fairly even because that's what it thinks is a correct exposure. Camera in fully manual and that means everything including ISO. We're going to keep the ISO nice and low because we're not using any ambient light so we'll let the flashes do all the work. That way we get the best possible image quality. So we use the aperture to determine the depth of field that we want, how much of jade or the background we want in focus, and then we just use the flashes to compensate. Most importantly, I also want the white balance on a set white balance. I don't want the white balance on automatic as that will mess up everything, particularly as I'm using gels. The reason I don't want it on automatic is because the camera will slightly shift the white balance between images as I change angles. And that means I'm gonna to have to edit each image individually. If I have it all at the same white balance, then all I have to do is make one change and it affects all of the images. The light isn't going to change in between um, shots because we are setting them up ourselves and there's no ambient light that's going to affect the image. So we can just use a fixed white balance. So I'm going to set it up to about 5000 Kelvin. If you don't have a Kelvin setting, you can just use any of these, whichever one's the closest to correct. Um, and at least then it's consistent. Because we're working with multiple flashes, I'm going to use, um, I'm going to set up to GR, not manual. The reason being I can then set up each flash completely individually to set powers. Com now, if you watch my last video, you'll remember that I had a key light next to me here um, pointing down at Jade. This setup is quite different. My key light is actually behind Jade, and I'm using that to um, fire some light down behind her as well as bounce that light back on her with a reflector. So it's doing the role of both the fringe light and the hair light, as well as the key light by bouncing that light back at her. This light here is simply going to give us a blue tint to the image. And we're gonna do that by putting a blue gel on it. So the one uh, hanging off the back is actually group B. So I'm gonna set that to quite a high power. And I'll set group A to a much lower power. Now that, we're ready. <laughs> <laughs> now that we're nearly ready, it's time to introduce you to Jade. Hello. Jade is a model, photographer, and also my partner. And because we live together, it's all safe. We're not breaking quarantine <laughs> rules. It's all cool. <laughs> I'm now going to show you a little bit about gels. If you remember my terrible drawing, there was a light with a blue gel on it pointed down at Jade um, and that was going to give a little bit of uh, blue tint to the shadows and also how to do it if you don't have blue gels. Now to add that blue tint I use this which is made by Rogue, um, it's a selection of lighting filters and they're all cut to shape to fit around a speed light. Um, they come in a very organised little pouch but um, I'm not very good at keeping them organised so they're all a bit of a mess. What you need to do is use a rubber band to place the filter around the front of the flash gun. Which sounds really simple, but it is really fiddly. <laughs> Did it! First time! <laughs> a couple of things to note, we've actually bought a piece of lino from b and It's just sitting in a scrap pile that they have going for really cheap. But you could just use a bed sheet. The reason we've done this at all is because when have you ever seen a wooden floored swimming pool? It just seems bizarre. We're going for an underwater inspired look. Um, so how realistic you want to make this is up to you. The last time I did this I had Jade's hair uh, quite loose and a little bit wetted but actually underwater your hair would look a bit dry and it would float around a lot so for this time what I've asked her to do is plait her hair so we're just trying that and see how it looks. So just, just check the light that we're getting is okay. I'm going to take a few test shots and what I'm going to be doing is shooting quite at a downward angle. That way I don't get any of the background. I don't have to worry about the wall. Um, another solution would be to have something that you would want on the background or use the lino all the way up the back wall. We don't have enough of ours to do that. 
I've just changed to a bluer gel, that way uh, I can intensify that blue look. And a photographer's best friend, reflector. Totally stole your line. <laughs> we're going to use this to bounce a lot of light back into Jade um, from the front. And we can just use a stool to prop that up. That's helping to lift the shadows on Jade's face. <laughs> because the flash is at the back at quite an angle, um, I can actually have Jade almost out from underneath the uh, water. That way I have a little bit more space to shoot. Um, What I've done is I've moved the light from my diagram out and round a little bit. It looks like it's doing very little, but if I turn it off and take the same image, you can see between the two, one has a much cooler look in the shadows. When you're shooting underwater, you tend to lose a lot of the red colors um, as they get absorbed by the water quite quickly. So it's having that blue tone that helps to sort of sell that look of being underwater. Yeah, maybe more on your back, your head lifted up. Put your flats down for me. All we have to do is run our hands through the water to create ripples and it will suddenly look like it's underwater. You can't quite reach, get something to help. You can use that to swish the water. Yeah, that works, great. If you've got someone at home to be your water swisher, your kids will love it and it'll be a real big help for you. In terms of posing, you kind of want your model to be lifted away from the ground. So I'm gonna ask Jay to just lift her head off the ground a little bit. That way it looks like she's floating off the bottom of the pool. More like that. I want to be. Yeah. It's a nicer shape than Because of the position the model needs to be in to lift her head off the ground it's quite a difficult position to hold, so it's worth getting all the lighting correct first and then shooting so she doesn't have to hold her head up for too long.
Right. Another way we can go about creating a blue tint to the images is by using an orange gel. I know that sounds incredibly counterintuitive. We can use white balance to our advantage by using an orange gel and then making the white balance much cooler to compensate. So if I take this image now, I've just put the light in a soft box just to make it a, a little bit more flattering. And I'm going to take the blue gel off um, for now, just leave it as it is. And try that. And I've turned the light that's hanging off the backdrop pole completely off. So this is just one light setup. Ta da! Do you remember these? They usually come in the packet with your speed lights. Most people just dump them in a draw somewhere or a cupboard and they never see the light of day again. They're actually kind of useful. I say that, mine's still got the plastic film on it because I have never used it. Oh, that's the most satisfying thing to do. So I'm gonna go full CTO. It came with half CTO and uh, full CTO. It, it just stands for something orange. CT orange. Color te oh yeah, color temperature orange. That's what it stands for. I'm pretty sure. Camera tangoed orange. Camera tangoed orange. In the case of Canon speed lights, you can put these on and it will automatically recognize that you've got this on. So if, you're, if you were using an automatic setting on the flash and the camera, it would compensate the white balance accordingly. Obviously, we're all shooting in manual now, aren't we? So, so what it's gonna do is turn the image horribly orange and then we're gonna compensate. So I'll show you that now. And we can do that, we'll deal with it later. Otherwise, I'll just make more of a mess at the moment. So. Pretty horrible, right? Yes. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna change the white balance to a much cooler setting. So I'll go to my white balance and I'm gonna set that to 2,500. Now, when I take a picture, the warmth of that gel is gonna compensate for the blue, or the other way around, the blue is gonna compensate for that warmth. So we should get something like that, where jade is roughly the right color, and the background's a lot bluer, so we can kind of get that blue tint. It's kind of Ooh, magic. So what we can do is turn on the other flash gun just to show you what it looks like with both. The other flash gun obviously doesn't have that orange gel on it, so that's gonna look very, very, very blue. The key light needs to be the one that's shooting through the water. So that's the one at the back, that's hanging off the back of the background stand, shooting through the water. And it needs to be without a modifier so that it's a hard light so that those ripples show up quite defined. So for the second lighting option, with an orange gel instead of a blue gel, I'm gonna move the orange gel from this light over to the one at the back, and this one will be bare. So basically the same setup, but swapped over. That way it can shoot through the water, and we get the same look as we did earlier without the blue gel, if you don't have that. It sounds very confusing, but I'm just showing you two ways of doing exactly the same thing. Now we're all set up. This speed light here has the orange gel on it, um, and this one here has nothing on it. So it doesn't have the blue gel on anymore. And we should get a very similar look to the original look with the blue gel on here and that one being bare. The white balance is still set to very cool and we're gonna see what it looks like. Exactly the same setup as we did earlier, just with a different 
channel setup. What you can do is actually use this to your advantage a little bit in another way um, and use the white balance stylistically. For example, if we wanted to make it look like it was a uh, golden hour and there was a sort of sunset light coming through, we can shift the white balance to bring in a bit more of that orange. So I'll show you what that looks like now. So I've got my white balance set to 3400 Kelvin now. See what that looks like. In terms of flash power, I've got the back light about two stops higher than the light without um, a gel, because I want that to be the main light source. This one's just giving some colour into the shadows. Okay. We're all done, all that's left to do is to drain the water tank and hopefully not get it all over the house and say goodbye to Jade. <laughs>
Same thing goes for the other ones. I'm just going to play with the colours and see if I can get them to match reasonably close, just to see how close we can get them with the two different techniques. <laughs> both of these I might just add a little bit more contrast on this one the trickier one will be the sunset one we want to have some blue in the shadows but we want to keep the highlights a bit warm so it looks like she's in shallow water at sunset there's still a bit of the color coming through so again I'll just use color balance mostly for this play with the shadows and then again just use a bit of dodging to brighten up Jade's face a touch. I've never actually shot underwater personally, but I feel like quite a contrasty look suits these sort of images. There we are. So one's a bit warmer, the other's going to be quite cool, but there are our finished images. That's it. From planning to post-production, we just did all of that in an hour. Remember, the underwater technique doesn't just have to be used for models. You could use it for product photography, toy photography, food photography even. It suits all sorts. The same technique could be used for other things as well. You could even use the reflections off the rippling water to create lovely patterns on the wall. If you're going to try this, there's a few things I would note. Make sure you've got enough screws holding the perspex of the wood, and you do a decent job on the sealant. It'll save some stress later on. Try and get someone to help you with the rippling of the water. If you can't, maybe put a spatula on a stick. For this one, I probably could have done with that, as it would have allowed me to get slightly further back from Jade and give me some room around her for some different compositions. When working with flash, my tip is to change one variable at a time. When you're working with multiple light sources, it can get complicated quite quickly. So if you just imagine it as a dimmer switch, if you just change one thing at a time, take a picture and see what it looks like, it'll make it much easier to get back to where you were if you make mistakes. I'm sure this will be asked in the comments, but are the gels even really necessary? And arguably they're not, you could do a lot of that color work in post-production. It's just my personal preference to shoot things as close to finished as possible. That way I'm not relying so much on the post-production process. That's it. Thank you all for joining me. I'll be sure to answer any questions in the comments. I'm on Instagram on at rajk.photo and I'm also on YouTube, so check me out there. Thank you to Wex and Canon for putting this on and I hope you all stay safe. Goodbye. <laughs>